Lord, along with that song, we join our prayers. You tell us to pray in Jesus' name, in line with your will and everything, everyone, everything that you are, Jesus, and everything you represent. We want to line our prayers up with you, and we do ask. You tell us to ask and seek and knock. We do pray for breakthroughs, Lord, for those who are struggling. We pray for answers to prayer. We pray for uh, deliverance from the evil one and from lies. Oh God, we, there's so many ways that we need you. Just every day reminds us that we are dependent on you. So we pray that you would work in our hearts today, Lord. Teach us from your word, encourage us, bless these people as they have gathered in your name, Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, again, just uh, greetings to our Zoom people there. Appreciate you guys joining with, with us, and if you can, you know, after the service, stick around, and uh, Brett will talk to you on Zoom and uh, pray for you. Okay, so today, we're on number four of our uh, heart disease kind of series here. Today is uh, bitterness. We covered... We covered three things before, and here's kind of a key indicators of different heart diseases, as we call them. Uh, number one was pride, and that uh, is where it says it, it's all about me. So whether you think you're great, or uh, whether you think others ought to think you're better and pay more attention to you, the result can be the same. It's focus on ourselves. Rebellion. And we all kind of have this at times where we say, no one's going to tell me what to do. Sometimes that applies with teachers or parents or employers. Um, but it, then that carries over to God as well. We don't want God to, uh, to control our lives. Hypocrisy was something we talked about last time. And uh, the, that's the kind of idea. I'm fine. Everything's okay. I don't have a problem. Um, and... You know, things like wanting attention for ourselves and who we are, other people to notice us, was a big deal that uh, Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees, to the religious folks in his day. They were doing, they looked good on the outside, but it didn't match what was on the inside. There was evil and sin there, but they looked very righteous. And so that uh, hypocrisy was kind of the, the play-acting of a role and not being honest with who they were. And today, if you want to, there's a little phrase that goes along with bitterness is, I'm going to make you pay. Bitterness is hanging on to something and wanting, wanting revenge. And uh, we'll get into that. So here's some questions just to start us thinking about the topic this morning is, do you have a bitter attitude towards someone? Or maybe ask it a different way. Who has hurt or offended or betrayed you in the past that if you think on that for any period of time, you can like still feel what they, that person did to you? Your emotional response just in your memory is close to how you felt when you first experienced it. Another question to ask is uh, who damaged you more than anyone else? Proverbs 14.10 says, Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. So that kind of bitterness there, each heart knows its own bitterness, that can, can be like sorrow, but it also can be this kind of, this slow-burning anger and resentment and hurt that lingers. And... The question then, does, does your heart know bitterness, not just sadness? And the next screen here is going to define, uh, define kind of New Testament word of bitterness, and that comes from the, the Net Bible, New English Translation. And uh, pikria is the Greek word. Uh, it can mean bitter gall. It can mean extreme wickedness. It can mean a bitter root, and so producing a bitter fruit. Uh, just a metaphor of a bitterness 
bitter hatred. It comes from another word, acridity, or especially poison, literally or figuratively, bitterness. It's very interesting that that's an illustration that people use often of bitterness is wanting to get even with other people, but that wanting to get even really is the poison that poisons your own spiritual life and your happiness. Uh, it's be like becoming a slave to the person who hurt you because you can't let that go. So that's a, a general idea of what uh, bitterness is. Here are some verses where that comes, uh, where that, that word, that definition is. In Romans 3.14 it says, their mouths are full of cursing <clears throat> and bitterness. Notice the connection there to what we feel and what we say. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. <clears throat> you can often tell a person has bitterness in their heart by what they say, and their words are, are angry and pointed. Acts 8.23 says, For I see that you are bitterly envious and in bondage to sin. Notice that connection there, too, of, of bitterness and bondage, of being a slave to sin because of because of, a lot of times, what other people have done to us. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians, he says, You must put away all bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and slanderous talk, indeed, all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. We'll come back to that verse, but the idea of when we, we as followers of Christ, what we need to do is we need to put away all bitterness. We don't need to nurture it, treasure it, protect it, kindle its little coals so that it is a burning fire within us. No, we need to put it away. James 3, 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and tell lies against the truth. So there is a bitterness that also comes with Comparison, comparing ourselves to other people, and the word jealousy is used there. We can, <clears throat> we can often resent what other people have to the degree that we have, we become angry because somebody else has succeeded. <clears throat> somebody has a better car, and I don't maybe have a car. Or they have housing and I don't have housing. Or they have a job and I don't have a job. Or they have a better job than I have. Or they, they had a better family than me. There's, there's no end in this world of comparison, sort of like Brett was talking about at the beginning of the service. We compare ourselves to other people. And there, is, there can become this bitter jealousy. Instead of being happy for someone else, you start be, becoming resentful and angry towards somebody else who has something that you don't have. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no one be like a bitter root springing up and causing trouble, and through it many become defiled. So here is that idea of this bitterness as being like a root. Now if you think of a root of a plant, you can't really see it, right? It's, it's underground, but that's where the, the nourishment is drawn from that is transmitted up into the rest of the plant, whether that be like a, a tree or any kind of plant that needs roots to draw nourishment. A bitter root seems to bring, bring up um, evil, and it produces a certain kind of fruit, certain kind of action, certain kinds of attitudes. So it says, that no one be like a bitter root springing up. Okay, not just so the, the root is going to show if that if your attitude, if our if our hurt and our pain stays there and draws its nourishment from the pain and the hurt and the resentment and the anger that we have, it is going to produce stuff in our bodies and in our attitudes. And and literally, there's uh, you know there's science that goes behind that that. People who have this kind of 
brewing anger and bitterness in their hearts um, often experience some kind of health problems, whether that be physical health or mental, emotional health, it is affected. And not only that, <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 15, the, notice the last phrase there, it says, through it, many become defiled. If you think that, if, if we think that our inner attitude and our own experience is just with us, uh, we are mistaken because it has an effect on other people. You probably know bitter angry people, and they are, they spread their poison to other people. They spread it. And it says many become defiled, affected by that in a negative way. And then one last example there, Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. In the most basic of unit between husband and wives, it is very possible to remember the negative stuff and to hold a grudge, to receive a hurt, and to hang on to that and to, in a sense, nurture that until there becomes a, a wall between a husband and a wife. It says, do not become embittered against them. <clears throat> so from that, bitterness can involve our memories, our attitudes, our feelings of pain. It's a, it's a deep word. <clears throat> so let's just do a little self-check here and ask ourselves, am I bitter? What would be the symptoms if I was? Here are just some suggestions to start us thinking. One, if, if your pain is still alive, you may be bitter. It's not, yeah, I remember a time when, but it's no, it's... <laughs> I remember the time that that happened, and I feel it still. Um, if you can't let it go, you may be bitter. If you hate someone from the past, you may be bitter. If your stomach churns when you think of someone, even if they are dead and gone, or haven't seen them for years, you may be bitter. If you react or get angry when someone acts like the person who hurt you, you may be bitter. There's a saying that goes, we we marry a person very much like our worst parent. And so we live with an ongoing reminder of maybe the person that wounded us in the past and their behavior triggers stuff in us because it's, it's still there in our heart. So we react in that same way. So as a kid, you maybe had a controlling dad and you grew up saying, you can't tell me what to do. And they made like a promise, like an oath that said, nobody's ever gonna tell me what to do. Or I'm not gonna ever allow that to happen again. Trust is broken. And they say, I'm never gonna trust anyone again. They make a, it's like they make a promise to themselves. And that is a promise that gets lived out even generationally. And it's, it's really sad. So think about if we have this reaction or we get angry when someone reminds us of someone in the past. Um, if you have a critical attitude, that can indicate bitterness. If you are insensitive to others, <clears throat> again, then there's that sense of pride. There's just, it's, a, it's about me, it's about my hurt, it's about my anger, and everybody else should be just as angry. Um, if you're ungrateful for what others do, if you think about revenge a lot, thinking that you would love for someone else to suffer the way you have. If you don't trust others, if you are depressed a lot, that could be a sign of bitterness as a root, if you get angry a lot. So those are some things to think about in our lives. What happens if we don't deal with this bitterness? Um, in Ephesians 4, passage, there's some, some preachers or teachers who have suggested that there is like a, a progression here of bitterness. And it says, you must put away all bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and slanderous talk, indeed all malice. I was listening to a sermon last night and the, 
The pastor did an amazing job of unpacking those words and explaining them. Um, but it seemed like it started with that bitterness kind of as a root. Something did not let, didn't get let go. And then there's, a, there's an anger, and then there is a, uh, so that's kind of like, like a, just keeping a, a, a coal there. He used an illustration, like if you, if you took like dirty rags that were like had, had gasoline in them or oil or something like that, and uh, there's this, this chemical reaction here. If you kept them in a closet, there would be this like smoldering amongst those rags. But, and when it smolders there, it's, it's, it's not really burning yet, but if somebody were to open that closet and suddenly that it would get flooded with oxygen, it would burst into flame. And he said that that's kind of that progression between that bitterness and a smoldering anger into wrath that just blows up and uh, quarreling and slanderous talk. So it, it comes, it starts within us and it's there and then something ignites it and then it's, it's an interpersonal thing with somebody else. That bitterness doesn't just stay with anger, wrath, but it just it spews itself out on others and talking about other people. Bitter people like to talk about those, those things from the past or those people. So there's that progression, and it's the alternative. So God gives us an alternative to bitterness. If we don't want to go down that path, the alternative is instead be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Oh, that should just feel like healing. If, if we can imagine, if we think about our bitterness, if we could actually remove that, if we have that taken out of us, you know, it's like a, a surgery of, of a cancer that is eating us, eating away at some part of our body. If that could be removed and that organ could be restored, Think of the, the healing and health rather than having that something that eats away at us. So that we can, instead we can be, be kind to one another. We can be compassionate. We can even be compassionate to, uh, to those who have hurt us. Jesus had some amazing words. And uh, also in, in Deuteronomy. That talk about loving our enemies about doing good to those who curse us, who hate us, who do bad things to us. How could this happen? It's when we get healed from that bitterness, when we confess it, when we can put it away, then we can for actually forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Let me just go to um, let me go to the next slide there. Hebrews 12. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So... We had that verse before, but listen to what comes before that in verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. We can't live at peace with people if, when we have a bitter root in us. And to be holy. We can't be holy if we have bitterness inside of us. He says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. When we have bitterness inside of us, we can't relate with God the way he intends us to have that close relationship. And he says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. We, when we hold on to bitterness, we are missing out on the joy, the grace that God wants to pour into our lives, that unmerited favor and power of God that is grace. And so it says, see to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So, there's a, 
what do we do then with bitterness? How can we get rid of it? And there's one particular passage, Romans 12, 17 to 21. And I don't have it on the screen, so I'd ask that you'd look in your Bible or the Bible in front of you. Nope. This one is, I don't have a slide for it. On page 1764. So we're going to go to Romans 12. And then starting with verse 17. This, I think this is a real key. I mean, we're, forgiveness is, is a huge part of that. And, and wraps around all of this. But I really want us to think about how, how can this happen? How can we get rid of bitterness? And it's, there's a something, there's a distinction that we need to make in our mind. And we need to realize this. In verse 17 of Romans 12, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Verse 21, it is possible, it's possible to be overcome by evil, even as a follower of Jesus. And I see that especially if we cannot find freedom from the wrongs that have been done to us in the past. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A key thing to remember here then is do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. If you want to keep your finger there and go back in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy 32, we will find a parallel there. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy and chapter 32. And then 30, verse 35 and 36. I hope I got that right. What? Page 325. Yeah. Don't look in the book of Numbers if you're looking for Deuteronomy, like I was just doing. <laughs> this music stand is uh, not as tight as it used to be, especially when I lean on it. Okay. So we're at Deuteronomy 32. 35 and 36. And again, that's page 325. Have I not kept this? Oh, no, no, verse 35. It is mine to avenge, I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. The Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees their strength is gone and no one is left, slave or free. Okay. What is God's role? What, is, what does God say is his job in situations where wrong has been done? He says, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. And then he promises, in due time, their foot, right? Where there is avenging to be done. That's why, you know, the Marvel, the Avengers, um, in a sense, they're ta they take on a role that's not really theirs. Now, there is, there is, a, there is a role for government, and Romans 13 says it's that... Uh, 
you know, the government doesn't bear the sword for nothing, that we should be concerned about our behavior, that we might not be punished. But when it comes to our own attitudes and our own desires for other people to get what they deserve, it says, God is saying, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. The Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. God is the judge, and when we step in and do God's job, and that's what I think bitterness wants to do, bitterness wants to get even. Bitterness wants people to suffer as you have suffered, especially those who have caused that. All right, let's, let's go back to the uh, Romans chapter 12 passage. Listen again to these words. Our role as Jesus followers is this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. God is reminding us, it's not my job to make somebody suffer for what they did to me. And then he says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Don't try, don't try to scheme, don't try to go around and take God's job. God will hold those people accountable. It is not our job. And then he says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, everyone, even those who have done us wrong. Now, there is certainly a place for protection, right? There are orders of protection. There are legal matters. There are, there are things where we don't necessarily put ourselves back in a dangerous situation, but it's not our job to take revenge. We can lean on the law, even the Apostle Paul uh, leaned on and took advantage of the Roman laws for his own protection. It is not wrong to do that. But what will devastate us is if we have a bitter attitude that will be poison to us and poison to everyone around us. And one really key thing, I think, is transferring the vengeance and the judgment to God. If we can make that transaction and say, God, I recognize that it is your job to make things right, to bring judgment and whatever is necessary upon the person or people who did wrong to me. And therefore, then it is, it is possible even to live at peace. He says, do not take revenge, verse 19, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Leave room. How do we leave room for God's wrath? We can't be involved in trying to take his job, trying to get even with those people. And even if it's just a dream, you know, it's a wish, in our, in our mental capacity, we are taking away God's role. We're not leaving room for God. We are stepping into God's place when we, want, when we want judgment to happen, when we want other people to suffer. We leave it in God's hands. And I believe that there's, in that transfer, that there is a freedom from bitterness and there is the open door for forgiveness. I think these things work hand in hand. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Why? For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Does that sound familiar? If you look at the bottom, though, it says, see, Deuteronomy 32, 35, just what we were looking at before. So Paul here in the New Testament is quoting that passage from Deuteronomy. It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And we can look, we can look at that as well. That's, letter, that's a Proverbs quote, Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. So, I guess for right now, I'd like us to think if there's anything left over. I know so the, the Psalm 139, 23, and 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way, any, even any bitter way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. So our prayer to God is, God, reveal to me if I have any bitterness towards anyone because that is a root that will defile me it will defile many and so our prayer as we come 
to communion this morning, that is, God, will you reveal this to me? If I have a bitterness and I want to transfer that to you, I, in a sense, we're saying to God, I have been trying to get even. I have wanted revenge. I've been hanging on to my hatred. And maybe I can't even repay them, but in my mind, in my dreams, I want something bad to happen to them. And I have been taking your place, God. So I want you to, I'm transferring that, that role of vengeance to you. I release that to you so that I might have the holiness of God, the peace of God, the grace of God in my life, that I might not be a bitter root or have any of those things that, that uh, Ephesians talks about. Anger, wrath, quarreling, and slander, and malice. So that we might be able to be kind and compassionate and forgiving, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Okay, there's a ton more that could be said, but why don't we, why don't we pause and we'll move to, to take communion now. And as a, as a part of that, I'd really like you to think about, and I know if, if you're on Zoom, you, you don't have the, the little cups of grape juice or the bread, but if you can find a way to remember what Jesus did, the slide is on the screen that reminds us that communion is about our need that Jesus met, the punishment that Jesus took that he did not deserve, but he took it. It was a transfer of my sins to Jesus. And in a sense, I too can transfer my hurt to Jesus because he is the final judge of, what, of all the evil that has been done to me. I transfer that to Jesus because he paid for that. He paid for my sins. He paid for everybody else's sins. And I can't do that. I can't bear the sins of others. I've already borne that consequence already, that pain of being hurt by others. And now I'm just... I'm exchanging that. I'm giving that over to God. And so I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died and rose to forgive my sins. I confess, I repent of my sins and receive Jesus. And part of that is recognizing bitterness, that bitterness is something that we must put away from ourselves. And this is, communion is a wonderful time to do that. Jesus, I give you my bitterness, my anger towards these people. And I receive your forgiveness and grace. And I dedicate my life to follow you and obey you. So if that A, B, C, D, admit, believe, confess, dedicate, represents the desire of your heart, okay? Doesn't mean, hey, I'm a member of the church or I, you know, I was baptized at a certain age. It doesn't mean, you know, this is good snack. It means this is the desire of my heart and uh, I still want it. I may have received Jesus decades ago, but this is my, still my desire and my, my practice that I admit I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus. I confess and repent of my sins, and I dedicate my life to follow him. It's a renewal. It's an examination, letter E. Okay? So if you have any questions, if you need to talk to somebody, I will... I'm usually over on the, the right over here. But uh, let this be a time where we have um, some business to do with God. And especially in the area of bitterness, that is a heart disease that will kill us. It could kill us, it can kill you physically, it'll definitely kill you spiritually. If, whenever we hang on to those things. So make this the time where we transfer those, those evil desires towards others to God, who will be the just judge of anyone who has hurt you, but he also is a God of compassion, who will forgive that, and Jesus is the one who took the payment for those sins as well. Not just your sins, but the sins that were done against you. He died for those. You do not have to bear them anymore. You can turn them over to him, and he will be your healer. He will be the one who brings kindness and compassion and joy to your heart instead of anger and hurt and bitterness. So, Father, we come to you. We thank you that Jesus died for our sins, and we 
We admit we need a savior. None of us can admit that, hey, I, I haven't sinned or I'm a pretty good person. We don't come making those foolish excuses. We admit that we're sinners. We believe, Jesus, you died and you rose to forgive our sins and to change our lives. And so we pray that you would forgive us. We confess those sins to you. We receive you, Jesus. And we dedicate ourselves to following you, having a different life. So, Lord, as, we, uh, as the music plays, we will remember what Paul said, that, uh, that we must examine ourselves before we come. But then we come remembering the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the, new, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Help us to do that, Lord, in a, in a solemn and yet joyful way as we exchange our sins, we exchange our bitterness for your justice and your grace and peace. Work in our hearts, Lord. Help us to understand this. Give us the faith to do it. Amen. All right. So as the music plays, as God leads you, you can come forward and take the bread and the cup.